Good morning. My name is Paul. I'm the lead pastor here at Crosspoint. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. And this morning, we're kicking off a brand new series called Saints and Sinners. And this is a series that we've been working on and planning and, and just kind of watching come to real realization over the last about six months. And I know for some of us, you're thinking, oh my gosh, you put that much time in it. I thought it would have been better. Um, <laughs> but it's okay. It, it, you know, that, that sometimes it just, we, we just plan and we think and we pray and we feel God leading. And this is one of those ones that just, you know, in my office, we kind of have a, a board of, of every month for like the next 12 months. And and just, you know, as God is leading and as we're praying, we kind of just put in, okay, this is the series for this month. And this one's just been sitting there for like six months. Like we just knew this was the series that we were going to be teaching on in October. And it's one that I think is really important for us as believers. It's important for us as we understand the distinction between saints and sinners and as we understand who we were and who we are. And over the next few weeks, we're just going to kind of unpack some great truth for our lives and for what God has in store for us. But, but as we do this morning, here's what I want us to do. I want us to just kind of jump off of this truth. If you guys will go ahead and pull out your message guide, you're going to see that there's this truth. And this is just our springboard for the entire series. And it's a very simple truth. And it's this. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. Every saint has a past. And every sinner has a future. And here's what we mean by that. That for those of us who have put our faith in Christ, who are Christ followers, that we are referred to in Scripture as a saint. Now, I know for some of you, maybe the religious tradition that you grew up in, saints had a whole different meaning, and it was so much more. And you're like, dude, there's no way I'm a saint. I didn't do anything. These people, they were saints. But the reality is this. The Scripture says that anyone who has put their faith in Christ their identity is one now where they are a saint, that they are someone who has been sanctified and set apart now, and that their past is their past. It is not their future. It does not define them anymore. What defines them is their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so every saint has a past. And the flip side is that every sinner has a future. Now, the Bible refers to sinners as those who have not put their faith in Christ, those who have not turned over their life to Jesus. And no matter how bad your life has been, your past, your experiences, no matter how much junk and garbage you have done or has happened to you, the reality that the scriptures tell us about who God is is that every sinner has a future, that the best is yet to come. And where God finds you is not where you are destined to stay, that you have a hope. And you have a future. And there's a tension now between this where we talk about that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future because there are times where as saints, we still wrestle with the habits of our past. We still feel like we're stuck in the middle of sin. And we don't feel so optimistic about our future, but we feel extremely guilty about our past. And for those of you who don't know Christ, you've, you've been wrestling because you haven't actually had to struggle with this because you just knew that you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you've done some things and that you're never going to be enough and do enough. But the reality is this, you don't have to do enough. What you have to do is surrender. And there's this tension. And I remember when I was a teenager and I was going to church and I had grown up in a very strict religious tradition and I remember when I moved to Florida, my friend invited me to his church because he was telling me all the things they teach at his church. And I was like, dude, your stuff is crazy there. And as a 13-year-old, I needed to go set his pastor straight because <laughs> they were teaching weird stuff like God loves you and like you could be saved from your sin and like, like God forgives you. And I'm like, bro, that is not the case at all. Like, dude, I got a picture of Jesus in my grandma's living room and his eyes follow you. <laughs> and like when you screw up, like you got to say all these prayers and like, it's like you, you got, and you got to give a lot of money to the church and stuff. And, and I went to this church and as I walked into his church, we went on a Wednesday night to this thing called the youth group. It was where the the, the students met, and I walked in, and all of a sudden, it was like my eyes were open, and I could hear the chorus of angels, and it was like, oh, ah! because it was me and him and 25 girls, and I was like, yes, 
This is the place for me, God. You have heard my prayers and answered. And my motivations were completely wrong for staying in church at that moment. But I could not help. The longer I was there, I got exposed to a message that was just so radical from anything that I had ever heard before. It was this message that God loved me in spite of who I was, what I had done, or where I had been, or what has happened to me. That he could offer me total and complete forgiveness. Because see, I didn't struggle with the reality that I was a sinner. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was going to hell. I knew that, man, I could never do enough good. Man, just the thoughts I had alone were enough to condemn me, right? Let alone the actions and the stuff that you get away with. But in that moment, I was confronted with this reality that there was a God who loved me. And that all my anger and all my hatred and all my bitterness and all my junk and all my garbage didn't have to be mine anymore. But I could let go of it. And who I was didn't have to be who I became anymore. See, that's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. In fact, we see that played out in Scripture. If you guys will turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, that's in the New Testament. It's one of the Gospels. It's one of the recordings of Jesus' life here on earth. And the words are going to be printed for you in your message guide, so go ahead and pull that out if you haven't already pulled that out. The words are going to be up here on the screen, and there's a stack of free Bibles in the back. That's our gift to you today if you don't have one. But in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 13, Jesus has begun his ministry, and he's going throughout the land, and he's calling the disciples. He's calling those who will be his initial followers. And we start the story there in verse 13. It says, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, and a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. There's just some baby names there if you guys are struggling, right? You got Levi, you got Alphaeus. My Alphaeus sounds pretty cool. I've never met an Alphaeus. I've met some Levi's, but I've never met an Alphaeus. I'm just saying, go ahead. We just put that away for a boy's name later, right? It's Alphaeus sitting at the tax collector's booth. And Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. Now, this scripture refers to Levi, but later on in scripture, Levi is more commonly referred to what you may know him as Matthew. Matthew. And I don't know why, but Jesus is big into changing people's names and stuff like that. So this is Levi, and says, Levi followed him. And then it says this, verse 15, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, the other translations talk about actually that Levi threw a party and a banquet because Jesus had chosen him when everybody else had rejected him. And I love this. Look at verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. Let's look at that for a second. Let's go back one screen here real quick. Look at this verse. It says, many tax collectors and sinners. This is how bad they thought of tax collectors back then. They actually had their own designation worse than sinners. They did, and, and they really, like, they really didn't, I mean, not that, like, we love the tax guy either, right? I mean, none of us love paying taxes, and, like, that's, like, a cruel, harsh reality when you wake up and you get your first paycheck, and you see, like, these deductions, and you're like, yo, what is up with this? Why are they taking all this money, Right? And then when you, like, at the end of the year, if you made a certain amount of money, and then you file your taxes, and then like, no, but you owe more. You're like, whoa, wait a second. And then all of us begin to rethink this whole taxes thing, right? Well, tax collectors, back in the ancient times, the way they would get their job is they would bid for their job. And they would go, and they would tell the authorities and the officials, they're like, listen, if you make me the tax collector, I'll collect 10% from everybody in this town. And then the other guy would come and says, yeah, but if you make me the tax collector, I'll collect 15% from everybody in this town. Now, who do you think they're going to hire? The guy who's going to collect more, right? They want that guy. And so the tax collectors, they were very, very cruel, mean, corrupt, cheatful people, always looking out to better their life at the expense of everyone else that they had grown up with. 
And so normally, that's why in this story, when it talks about when he invited people over, the tax collector hung out with other tax collectors and other sinners. And the scriptures often refer to literally like tax, like there's a sinner and like a sinner could have been a murderer, like you were a sinner, but, but at least you're not a tax collector, right? Like they had their own hierarchy of sin and like tax collectors didn't even qualify to be a sinner. That's how bad they were. Like that was like the ultimate diss to somebody. Oh yeah? Well, you're a sinner. Oh yeah? Well, you're a tax collector. Oh, <laughs> I can't even, right? That's how serious this was. And I love the story. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. See, here's the reality of Jesus. Sinners don't have a problem with Jesus, and Jesus doesn't have a problem with sinners. It's the religious folks who have a problem with both. Because the story continues... For there were many who followed him. And look at the next line. It says, and when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. So there's this huge banquet in town and the tax collectors there and the sinners there. But the religious people show up too because, man, you don't, you, if there's free food, church folks are coming, right? Like nothing changed in thousands of years. Free food, church folks are going to be there. In fact, if church folks come, there's just normally food too. They're going to bring some food. You're going to bring some food. Everything you know, phew, next thing you know, it's a fellowship dinner. Church is happening. It says, when the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they got upset about this. And they couldn't understand because, see, like, they would never eat with sinners and tax collectors, even though they're here at the banquet eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. But what they would do that is, like, they would all sit over here, and all the sinners would sit over there. And then all they would do is talk bad about all the sinners. And some of you, maybe, maybe you grew up with the church like that. Maybe that's your experience. In fact, maybe it's just a miracle that you're even here today giving church a second try because your experience was one where they were so judgmental that it, it wasn't worth being exposed to that. But see, Jesus was really welcoming and loving of sinners, and sinners were really blown away by that, so they responded. In fact, when Levi got chosen to follow Jesus, Levi threw a banquet and invited all of his friends to come and to hang out with his new friend, Jesus. And then the teachers of the law and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors. And then they asked the disciples, look at this next line. They asked his disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? You ever have somebody that like doesn't have the courage to ask you, confront you, or talk to you, but they'll talk to somebody else about what you're doing? No? Well, just get on social media. It happens every day. <laughs> right? Like, like, you know, like, like everyone, man, you are so bold on that keyboard. Like, you, man, you, like, you will say things that you would never say to somebody's face. Because in my day and age, if you said that to somebody's face, you got punched in the mouth, right? But in today's kinder or gentler, no, you can say all kinds of cruel and insulting things as long as there's this internet distance between you. And so here are the Pharisees and the religious leaders. They're sitting there. They're at the same banquet, right? They're all having dinner. They're, we're there. And they walk up to his disciples, Jesus' disciples, and they're like, man, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners. Now, you know Jesus heard this because it says, on hearing this, Jesus said. They said it loud enough, and they confronted Jesus' followers. They confronted the Jesus' followers about why Jesus was doing what Jesus was doing. And they said, well, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And then Jesus he pipes up and he says this. On hearing, he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And Jesus just frames it up for them really simple, and he just said this. He said, the whole reason I'm here is for them. It's not the healthy who need a doctor. Most of us normally don't ever go to the doctor when we're healthy. And the three or four of you that do, A plus, way to go. <laughs> the rest of us never go to the doctor. And even when you know you're sick, you don't want to go to the doctor. And even when you're at the doctor, you don't want to be at the doctor. And as soon as you're at the doctor, you feel better. It's this cruel, sick joke of the waiting room. <laughs> right? And Jesus is saying, listen, he goes, the whole reason I'm here isn't for the righteous. I didn't come for the perfect people. I came for the sinners. 
The problem is the sinners know that they're sinners, and the religious people don't know it, that they're sinners too. And Jesus kind of like, I could just see that moment. It was like a mic drop moment, and like everybody got all quiet because like the story kind of ends right there. <laughs> There's nothing else recorded about how the rest of the night went. Like, and you could just see, though, there was probably, like, the one fat disciple who just had to, like, break the silence and be like, can I have some dessert, please? <laughs> right? Because, like, I mean, could you just imagine, like, so, so he, it's like the showdown, like, here's the tax collectors, here's the sinners, here's the religious guys, the religious guys think they're so much better than everybody else, and so they confront the followers of Jesus. Jesus hears it. His disciples don't even have to answer. Jesus is like, no, no, I got this, Peter. Let me answer their question. And he just said, because I'm here for the sick the broken, the lost, the blind, the hurting. I'm here for those who know that they're sick and want to get better. I'm here for those who know that they're sick and want to get better. I'm here for the sinners. I'm here for the not perfect, but who long to be better. I'm here for the person who's tired of being caught in the cycle of sin and wants to break that addiction. I'm here for the person who doesn't think they've got it all together but knows they don't have it all together, but they'd like to get it better together. I'm here for the one who's struggling and wants to find freedom. I'm here for the one who says, you know what, I'm not the best that I could be and I want to be better. He's like, I'm here for them. Now here's the reality. And this simple truth is found in Romans 3.23 and, and just kind of just paints this picture that we all just need to kind of just sit with for a second. In Romans 3.23, it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's just a simple truth that just says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you guys will go ahead and take out that trusty crosspoint pen, you could just circle the word all. Thank you for the seven of you doing it. I see all the rest of you not doing it. Your passive aggressiveness does not phase me. <laughs> For all have sinned. In other words, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Look around. No, just right now, turn to your left. Turn to your right. Look behind you. Look in front of you. Then take out your phone, flip the camera around, and look at it. <laughs> Not a perfect person in the room. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Whether we've got that terrible, um, like unbelievable story or just a mediocre story, we've all blown it. We've all fallen short. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. All of us. And the problem was back in that moment, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees didn't realize they needed Jesus just as much as the tax collectors and the sinners. They didn't realize the reason they got invited to the banquet Two, wasn't so that they could question who else was on the guest list. It was so that they could sit in the presence of the Savior. But they missed it. They missed it because they were so focused on the sin of everybody else. They never stopped to look inside and said, maybe I need Jesus just as much. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God. In Romans 6, 23, just three chapters later, God says this amazing truth, and it just says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. See, that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that sin, it separates us from God because God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. God is a perfect God. God doesn't sin, but we do, and our sin separates us. Our sin needs to be atoned for. Our mistakes have a debt that needs to be paid. And then the love of God and his grace and his compassion, he doesn't say, well, that's just too bad for you. No, he did something about it. And the scriptures say he sent Jesus 
to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin, to pay the price that we could never pay, to right the wrongs that we could never fix, to pay the debt that was so overwhelming it would cost him his life, but he willingly laid it down for us. And so it says, but the gift of God. Man, I love the imagery here, but the gift of God. You know a gift is something you give somebody that they don't have to earn. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you grew up in a religious tradition or an understanding that in order to get God's grace, in order to get God's forgiveness, in order to get God's favor, that you had to earn it. Well, that's absolutely not true. In this scripture right here, it says, but the gift of God. When I give a gift, there's no strings attached. That's why it's called a gift. If there's strings attached, it's not a gift. It's a bribe. Right? I mean, and you all have lived long enough to know that you've ever gotten a gift that came with strings attached. It's not a gift. It's a bribe. And God's not in the bribery business. He's in the gifting business. Why? Because we talked about last week that our God is a generous God. A generous God gives gifts. And the greatest gift that he gives is eternal life through Christ Jesus. He is giving us the means to find freedom, hope, and forgiveness. He's giving us the means to cross over from being recognized as a sinner to become a saint. The gift is eternal life. The word eternal means forever. Forever life with God through Jesus for the gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 explain it a little bit more in depth, but it just talks about how it is the gift, not by works, so that no man can boast. Listen, if you could earn your way to God, then it would rest on your shoulders and you could take credit for it. But you and I could never take credit for what God has done. It is the gift. It is the gift of God. But the gift of God is eternal life. And I love this. In Christ Jesus. There's about 100,000 other words that could have been right there between life and Christ Jesus, but the word in means that this is the way, the only way to find life. It's in Jesus. Literally, life in Jesus. Life in Jesus. There's no other way. It's the only way, but it is such an amazing way. When we think about this Jesus, maybe you don't know who he is. Maybe you had some misunderstandings. But here is a firsthand account of what Jesus was like. Because this story also appears in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew is Levi. And he writes about it too. He writes about that was his house, and he was the guy that was called, and Jesus showed up for him, and Jesus found him working at the tax collector's table, and Jesus came up to him, and he said, I choose you, and Matthew walked away from his past that was so bad in that day and age, it had its own category for sin, it didn't even qualify to become a sinner. No, you were a tax collector. And he was forever changed by one encounter with Jesus. So when we sang earlier, open up my eyes, and talk about that moment where his eyes were opened, and then there in the midst of it, how awesome the religious folks show up and try to poke him in the eye and be like, well, why is he doing this? And then Jesus just speaks up and he says, no, 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 you need to understand something. These sinners and tax collectors, they're my people. And I came for them. And you religious folks, you're one of them too. And I came for you. And I came to change everybody's life so that you would no longer be a sinner with a future, but you'd be a saint with a past. Live in the present of being the saint with a past going towards your eternal future in Christ Jesus. Man, what a powerful moment. What a powerful encounter with Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that maybe for you, this kind of just frames up who you are and your identity in Christ. 
that maybe if you've been a believer, that this kind of just puts some perspective of who you were and who you are. Because here's the reality, too. It gets real simple the longer we walk with God to forget what it was like when we didn't. And when you forget what it was like when you didn't, it's real easy to become judgmental and hypocritical. And it's real easy to start pointing out other people's flaws and forget about you once were lost too. It's real easy to become a hypocrite and forget that you were just as broken and just as much in need of Jesus. In fact, even when you put your faith in Jesus, you still need him every day. Like you're never going to arrive on this side of eternity. If you don't think that's true, just get stuck in traffic later. (laughs) Just try to find a checkout line that says 10 items or less and the person in front of you has 23. How do I know? Because I count. You think you're never going to struggle with sin? Just call a family member. They'll remind you how much of a sinner you used to be in five minutes on the phone. Right? Man, we're still going to struggle. Why? Because we don't live on an island. We are surrounded by people, and people just bring out the best in us and the worst. But each and every day, it just reminds me that I'm still a guy who needs Jesus. No longer a guy stuck in my sin, but a saint who's called to be better. And I'm going to walk as best I can this day and worry about tomorrow if I see it. That's what it means to be a saint with a past. I remember my past, but not out of guilt and shame, but out of gratitude that that's no longer who I am and where I'm stuck. I remember my past so that I can use it to help encourage people who are stuck in that reality that they can get out of that too. I remember my past because it keeps me humble enough to not wander too far away from my Jesus. I remember my past, but it doesn't define me, and I don't live in my past anymore. I'm a saint, and I got a future, and my future is Jesus. Would you guys go ahead and pull out that Connect card that my friends Hector and Taylor talked about. Hector and Taylor, man, they're such a cute couple. Aren't they? Man, they're a cute couple. And they got cute kids, cute people making cute babies. It's adorable. They're wonderful. Love those folks. But if you guys would go ahead and pull out that connect card that Hector and Taylor talked about, on the bottom there are some next steps. And I would love to call our attention to those next steps. And you see the first next step says this, I will accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I will accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Maybe where you're at today, that this Jesus thing just all of a sudden became pretty clear. Like your eyes were closed and all of a sudden today they just kind of opened and what you realize is that you were a sinner, but Jesus is calling you home to become a saint. That just like that day when Jesus called Levi from the tax collector, with Jesus is sitting at the table inviting you to be a part of his family. And that where you were isn't where you're destined to stay. That you could put your life in God's hands. That you could accept his free gift of Jesus. And today, that's what that first next step says. That I will accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That I'll realize that God has a free gift for me. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus paid a price on the cross for my sins and mistakes, and rose from the dead so that I would be free, forever free. And if that's you, then I'm going to give you that opportunity to accept that gift this morning. We call that an invitation. And so here's what I'm asking. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody moving around, no distractions right now. But the Holy Spirit of God is calling you, not in an audible voice, but in something that you feel so real and so strong in this moment. And surrender your life to Christ. You just pray these words silently as I pray them out loud. Dear God, here I am. And I want to receive your free gift of Jesus. I'm so glad that you didn't quit on me and you didn't give up. 
and that you found me here today. And I want to follow you. So I surrender. All that I was, all that I am, all that I ever be, I surrender. I don't want to fight. I don't want to be in control anymore. I don't want to call the shots, God, because look at where it's got me. I want you to be in charge. I want you to call the shots because you love me. You created me. You redeemed me. And you've always been there for me. So God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming for me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you go ahead and check off that next step? It'd be our honor to walk alongside of you as you take your next steps of faith. You'll see there's a second next step, and it says, I will repent about. Now, here's the reality. Just because I've put my faith in Christ doesn't mean I'm still not going to struggle with sin. It doesn't mean I'm not going to make bad choices. It doesn't mean I'm not going to be tempted. Maybe that there's some temptation. Maybe there's something you're struggling with. And today, God's saying, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to repent of this. And repentance is, it comes from a military term that literally means an about face. It means stop running towards that and turn and run towards what God has for you. And maybe today there's something that God's just calling you to repent from. That yeah, you're a saint. Yes, you are redeemed by God. Yes, you have a hope and a future and eternal life. But it doesn't mean that you still can't struggle. And maybe today is the day where you just say, God, I don't want to struggle with this anymore. I want to give it back to you. I want to be free, God. I, I want to surrender to you, Jesus, this thing. I'm going to repent from it. I'm going to turn from it and walk away from it. Maybe it's a habit or a hang-up or an addiction or a struggle or a lifestyle. You say, God, this isn't the best that you have for me. I'm going to turn away from it, and I'm going to walk towards the best that you do have for me. Third next step says this. I'll get baptized on Sunday, October 27th. Yeah. October 27th is our next baptism service, and baptism is an outward expression of what has happened inwardly, of me putting my life and my faith in Christ Jesus, that my old life is dead and buried. That's, what, that's what's symbolized by going under the water. And when I rise up out of the water, I am a new life, a new creation. I'm going public, and I'm letting the world know that before I was a sinner, but then I found Jesus, and I accepted his free gift, and I've risen up, and I am now a saint. I'm not perfect, but now I'm walking with my Savior and trying to become more like him each and every day. It would be our honor to baptize you if you put your faith in Christ today or in weeks, months, or years past. Go ahead and sign up right there on your Connect card or at the kiosk out in the lobby. Man, I hope we have so many people sign up for baptism that the whole service is just baptism. Wouldn't that be awesome? Just so many people going public and telling friends and family members, listen, my old life is dead and buried, but risen in this place is a new creation in Christ. Listen, if you've never got baptized and you've been putting it off and putting it off, listen, here's your sign, get baptized. Right there, there's your sign, get baptized. You wanted a sign from God, you got it, get baptized. Sign up right now. Let's make these services so packed with people going public with their faith. That that is the message that Sunday. Last next step says, I will memorize Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. That sin has consequences and the consequences are death. But here's the good news. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Man, I love this. But the gift of God is not maybe, not could be. It is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our hope, the lover of our soul, the Redeemer of our lives, our Savior. Man, what great truth this morning. In just a few moments, we're going to take up the offering. I just wanted to kind of give you guys a quick update over the last month We've been taking 10% of everything that came in to give to Hurricane Relief, and we've raised over $10,000 for that. Just through your faithfulness and your generosity. Man, how awesome is that? How awesome is that? 
just through faithfulness and giving that we're able to help and bless ministries that are there on the ground, helping families in need, rebuilding their lives. Just thank you for that, guys. Thank you for that. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, as we wrap up our time today, in this moment, Father, we just kind of still ourselves before you and we just reflect on the truth that we've heard, on the next steps you've called us to take. And in these next few moments, Father God, as we take up the offering, Father, I pray that we would just give out of obedience to what you have called us to give. That, Father, we would hold on to everything with an open hand, not a clenched fist, but an open hand of generosity. Father, that we would realize that you are the giver who has given us the greatest gift in the world, Jesus, and continually pour out gifts of blessing upon us. Father, we love you and we praise you. And now, Father, as we worship, I pray that we would just sit tight. God, the band is going to lead us and then we'll stand together and worship. But that, Father, our worship would come from a point of gratitude for all that you have done and that we would celebrate as we go out of here, Father, with our brothers and sisters of faith, the opportunities to live, to serve, and to honor you and to invite our friends and family to come back with us next week to hear about this Jesus who redeems sinners and makes them saints. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.